As companies go global, so does their commitment to corporate social responsibility, but that also opens up a new set of challenges. INSEAD professor Michael Witt has been examining the approaches to CSR in different countries and regions. He joins us now. Michael, thanks for joining us today on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you for having me. Michael, what are some of the key differences you've found in your research when looking at Asia, uh, Europe and the United States? Well, actually, there are many differences, but uh, the key difference in particular would be whether CSR is what we call explicit or implicit, uh, where explicit basically means it's, it's up to the company uh, to do it. There's no real kind of social kind of uh, expectation that it will be done, and as such, it really becomes an explicit kind of activity that companies parcel out and do uh, in addition to and separately from whatever they would be doing as a core part of their business. Implicit basically means that usually there is a societal expectation and uh, in many cases then actually CSR becomes part of, of, uh, of what the company does as a matter of course anyway. And uh, fundamentally what we see here is a very interesting pattern because we, we notice among five countries, uh, we're talking about the United States, Germany, uh, we talk about uh, Korea and uh, Japan, and of course not being a country but part of China, uh, Hong Kong. We notice that uh, counter to what uh, the literature actually found earlier, we only have one place that really uh, treats CSR as something explicit, and that is Hong Kong. And what was it about Hong Kong that made companies treat CSR that way? Well, it's, it seems like that uh, b among executives, senior executives in Hong Kong, but apparently also in Hong Kong society, uh, there's no clear expectation that, that companies engage in any kind of social responsibility activities. So uh, what basically happens there is uh, usually companies or entrepreneurs, many of these companies are family run and in many uh, cases owned or at least controlled. Uh, once they have attained a certain level, uh, in terms of wealth, uh, that is when they usually transition to, uh, to engaging in CSR. And what does your research tell you about the perceptions of how companies should be approaching society? Um, how are they expected to be good corporate citizens? Well, again, it depends a little bit by, uh, by country, right? So if we now transition to the implicit category, if you will, uh, you get a range of things. And uh, so, for instance, uh, for, for German executives, uh, uh, the, f the very fact that they actually engage in production of goods and services is actually already a contribution to society. So the people will quite often say, uh, we produce needed goods and services for society. Funny enough, the customer doesn't really pop up, which is something that is consistent with the, you know, a little bit the caricature of German companies, uh, you know, where the customer somewhere is nowhere in the picture, right? It's basically the notion of engineers uh, preparing a very good product, and then if the product is good, then they will sell. And uh, so that would be their notion of how you contribute. On the other hand, in a Japanese context, for instance, uh, executives would be much more focused on serving society uh, by uh, treating their employees well and also by making sure that these employees have long-term stable jobs. So you see quite a range. The big standout in your research seems to be Japan, which puts the most emphasis on the welfare of society. How do Japanese companies conduct CSR? What are some of the best practices? The number of practices uh, to it, but actually it's, it's very interesting to listen to Japanese executives describe you know, uh, in th their notion of why their companies exist and, and why they should have a right to exist. Uh, I remember talking with one very senior executive and uh, the question was, you know, what is your company there for? And um, actually uh, his answer was that the first thing we need to ask ourselves is why does society permit our company to exist? Which is a a striking question. I think in the United States people wouldn't, wouldn't even dream of asking themselves this question because at least in principle you have the right to pursue happiness and uh, you know happiness of course being code for wealth. Um, you know obviously uh, founding a company is a vehicle for this. So I think in Japanese executives minds there's a very strong notion that uh, serving society is needed and that then basically leads to the next question namely how, how do you best do that. And there the, the the clearest, best formulated expectation of Japanese society is indeed the provision of jobs. Right? Uh, not necessarily no longer the notion of you know, provide as many jobs as possible because there are pressures against that, but at least uh, those people who are actually in the company uh, need to be provided for. And then given how the labor market works in Japan, uh, where it's very difficult to find new jobs, uh, actually uh, once you have taken responsibility for an employee, you also need to take this to its logical conclusion, namely keep this, per uh, this person employed. What about the underlying societies in these markets and what do they impress upon the firms uh, in terms of expectations? In most societies there's, there's, there's a notion of uh, what companies should do 
and what is acceptable. And uh, fundamentally, this gets transmitted to top management in two ways. Um, uh, one is socialization. Obviously, to the extent that people are from there, they will grow up in this society and uh, they will internalize some of these values that, uh, that society has about what is proper behavior by companies and what is not. Uh, the other thing is, uh, and you see this in particular in Korea, um, a more kind of conflictual relationship. Um, the relationship between large businesses in Korea and uh, the population as such in, in Korea is, um, shall we say, at a minimum difficult. Uh, I remember a survey, and I think it's also cited in the paper, and it came out just uh, a year ago, or a little longer than that, uh, where people actually found uh, in, in a survey that approximately 9 in 10 Koreans actually think that uh, um, the chebol, in other words, large conglomerates in Korea, are quote-unquote immoral. That is a striking statement. And um, this kind of way of thinking in society as such also uh, influences and informs um, the way, for instance, you have labor relations or employment relations then. Uh, when you look at Korean strikes, um, they have been f decreasing in, in numbers, but generally speaking, uh, you still got a good amount. And they tend to be really highly conflictual. Similarly, society as such is, is very ready to, to beat up the chebol, right? In particular, um, now in Korea, since everybody's networked uh, and has, has mobile phones and things like this, uh, it's, it's very difficult for companies uh, to really kind of uh, stay out of the limelight and, and, and not be on the receiving end on a lot of social pressure. And social media now is increasingly opening up companies and making them more transparent. Uh, how is this affecting the approach of CSR? It basically means it's a lot harder to have a large divergence between the facade that you present to the public and, and what you actually do. And um, so that there needs to be more congruence there, uh, because otherwise you'll be exposed. Right? Uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier these days. If something goes wrong, uh, and this can happen, right, uh, having engaged incredible CSR beforehand would usually uh, give you a certain kind of buffer. Right? So you have some, if you will, political capital, uh, and that w may limit then the, uh, the fallout uh, in what follows afterwards. Despite all of these differences, whether they be across region or across territory, uh, is CSR facing convergence? Will cross-border CSR ever be one and the same? Personally, I believe no. Right? I mean, obviously, time will tell. But personally, I don't believe so. The reason why I'm saying this is because we see that um, it's, it's not just that these societies have very different ideas about how, so, uh, how companies uh, should contribute to society. They also have very different ideas about what the reasons for the existence of companies themselves are. And uh, on top of that, of course, they, they are culturally very different. Uh, so that means they have different worldviews, understand things in different ways. And they're also institutionally very different, so different laws, rules, regulations, practices. Michael, thanks for joining us on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you, Chris.